Now we have uh, Vince Russo, the head writer of World Championship Wrestling, and the power that be, powers that, the head of the powers that be. How you doing, Vince? All right, Dave. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that's been uh, that's been uh, going on and everything. Uh, what's what's your feelings now that you've been uh, writing the show for uh, six weeks or so and uh, been in there? Um, you know, what what do you think are the pluses and the minuses and and what needs to be worked on the most as far as the WCW product? Well, um, I think there are I think I think there are pluses and minuses to be honest with you. I, I think the pluses are um, there's been no problems whatsoever working with with the talent. Um, you know, some of the talents who I thought, uh, you know, might be a little leery of our system have really turned out to be the, the best students, which is, which is really surprised me. And I think if, if, if you, if you're watching the product, you probably know who I'm talking about. Um, one of the problems we have though is, you know, I mean, I'm a very impatient guy and to be honest with you, I wanted to, I want to turn around the ratings yesterday. But we're in a situation now where, you know, the, the players need to be put in place and storylines need to develop in, in order for us to get where we're going. And really that's been happening since day one, uh, you know, around Starcade. It will take another huge step to where we want to go. And, you know, eventually in about two or three months, everything should be into place. Um, I think um, th there's great room for improvement when it comes to the production end, and I think a lot of that has to do with, too, just the production at WCW just isn't used to the fast pace of, you know, the New York way, so to speak. Before we came, they had wrestling matches that went, you know, two segments. Sometimes they went three segments. Uh, now it's basically Crash TV, where it's a pre-tape to a live interview to a match. And, uh, you know, production-wise, they're really adapting to our system. So I think we have, uh, you know, a great way to come when it comes to that. But, I mean, I'm happy. We, we, I, I've only written seven shows. Um, it hasn't even been two months uh, there. There has been a difference in the ratings. And I'm about where I expect it to be at this point. As far as just where the story, the stories are about where you expected them, or did oh you yeah, no, absolutely, because you know, as I said, uh, you know, you, you know, you notice we put some players on the shelf in order to bring them back at the appropriate time in the appropriate role, and you know, things are starting to flush themselves out. And again, that's why I said at the beginning, you know, it was going to really take a good six months before you saw a difference because. You know, you, you, first of all, you needed to stop the bleeding, and then second of all, you just needed to really get the players in place. Now, one of the things that, that I think has been um, lacking is a certain continuity between what's on TV and building up uh, pay-per-views and even more house shows. When I hear, like, that, that you're doing these house shows with Bret Hart in the main events or, you know, defending the title against Ric Flair, it doesn't fit with television because Ric Flair is never mentioned on television and Rick you know and there's no program between the two of them and maybe it's a, it's it may very well be a, a hell of a house show match but it's like if that's what's you know to me it's like if that's what's going to be at the house shows in the main events then 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 Ric Flair should be on television doing an angle with Bret Hart you know I, I agree with that Dave but that that was something that was really booked a long time ago and I mean as you know WCW they, they really dug themselves in a hole when it came to house shows. I mean, you know, there were a history of, you know, changing the plays at the last minute, and, you know, they killed a lot of houses in a lot of towns. And, I mean, I, I got to be honest, I'm starting to see that myself as I go town to town, and I'm not seeing a big crowd, and then, you know, either a Mike Graham or, or an Arn or a Kevin, they're explaining to me, well, what happened the last time a house show was in this town. So, you know, we were in a situation where we wanted to tell a story with Flair. He was already booked in some house shows. So rather than, you know, pull him off those house shows and, you know, put the screws to the people once again who might have already paid money, we just decided to, you know, let, you know, let's fulfill our obligations, let Flair work the house shows. Because, again, I mean, enough damage has been done in the past. So, so that was really a point of just trying to fix prior commitments. Now, what's your reaction? The, the WWF has had a tremendous media problem this week with um, many major sponsors pulling out due to the, um, you know, the, the type of product that had been presented. And, in fact, you were probably a big proponent of going in that direction. 
And last night's show was the first time that they, they really did tone the show down. I don't know if it's going to be a long-term thing or just until the heat blows over. And I think it just depends on the media and the sponsors' reaction. I don't think anyone knows really where this one's going. But what's your reaction to that and knowing that um, if, if it had worked, if someone did that to WWF and was able to get whatever it was, eight, nine sponsors, like within a, a week or two to leave, that perhaps the same thing could happen to WCW if it got just slightly more raunchy because it's, you know, I know, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I got a couple of things to say about that, and, and I'm glad you, you brought that up. Number one, I have to believe only because I was at the WWF for so long and I was really in the thick of a lot of things, the reality of the situation was WC, WWF had sponsors lined up ready to do business with us. I mean, there really weren't enough uh, enough uh, holes to fill, so a lot of people were put on a waiting list. See, the thing is, to be honest with you, really when it comes to sponsors, if, if you're doing the number, if you're doing the demos that they're looking for, they tend to turn the other cheek. Now, with the WWF, there was always heat with the sponsors. I mean, that's nothing new. I really have to believe it's a, it's a little different case now. I don't think the heat was really sponsors dropping the WWF because, again, there were other sponsors waiting in line that would be glad to pay their money. I think that he comes with now, uh, you know, Vince and the WWF being a public company. Now you have to answer to stockholders, and that's a totally different ball game. So I think that had a lot more to do um, with toning down the show and bringing the rating down than actually, you know, the sponsors did. But, um, you know, and again, I'm saying this uh, to be honest with you. I'm not taking any shots at the WWF. I don't have any reason to do. They do they, their thing, and I, I, I do my thing here. But the reality of the situation is there was such a limited roster at the WWF. There were only so many guys that we had. And, I mean, and I'll tell you now, a, a huge problem that WWF had and probably their biggest problem that will be their downfall, in my opinion, is their talent relations uh, department. It's, uh, you know, it's a very weak department. And even before the SmackDown show started, you know, I was on my soapbox telling Vince, you know, Vince, you, you can't have another show and not add any talent to the roster. Well, you know, talent wasn't added to the roster. So we were eating up talent and storylines very quickly because we only had so many players. So we got to the point where when we were writing the television, we had to write shock TV in order to keep people interested in the storylines and in the angles because we didn't have the fresh faces where we could start new angles. And that's really the difference in WCW, that there's so much talent here and so many faces and people that we haven't even developed yet that the storylines are endless. So there really isn't a need to, you know, have shocking TV and push the envelope to keep the viewers because there's a great amount of talent. And, and, and that's why I'm really, I'm not concerned about that at all because, again, we, we had to go where we went in the WWF at a necessity. We don't have to do the same thing in WCW. We're going to start with Mike in Pennsylvania. Mike, how's it going? Oh, all right. How are you doing, Dave? I'm doing pretty good. Okay, my question for uh, Vince is, so well documented on the Internet that uh, you have little interest in uh, Japanese and Mexican wrestling. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, since uh, WCW has a lot of great international talent, if you're uh, willing to utilize them better and uh, sort of learn the style, so we can see uh, guys like Psychosis, La Parca, Kaz Hayashi. You know, that, 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 that's a good question, and I'm glad you asked it because, see, one of the, one of the problems that I personally always had with, um, um, you know, the luchadors and also the, the Japanese wrestlers is, especially wrestling in 1999, a, a big part of the formula to, to, to make somebody successful is really the, the personality. I mean, uh, you know, Rock is the Rock because of his personality. Yeah, he backs it up in the ring, and when the bell rings, he goes. But it was his personality that got him over. And I always felt that, uh, you know, with the luchadors and with the Japanese wrestlers, yes, they're great workers. I, I agree. 
But the other side of that is they need to have the personality to really become stars in the United States anyway. And, you know, the fact that they, they uh, most of them can't speak English is a hindrance to them, and it, it's very difficult for them to relate with American fans and vice versa. However, the more I'm around the talent, you know, at WCW, you know, we, we've kept everybody around, you know, Psychosis, Hoovy, and uh, Kaz. The more I'm around these, these individuals, the more I can see personality and I can learn them and get to know them and see how to develop them so as I become more familiar with them and I can see what their what their strengths are when it comes to personalities I think you're going to see them play a bigger role in the product uh, you know w once we we both are on the same page basically one thing I want to say is, is um ECW has has used a lot of these guys and and gotten and I'm not saying that they that any of them can be the main event on a pay per view and I'm not sure that they can I'm, there are limitations of of size and there are limitations of not knowing the language but um I saw like uh you know when Psychosis was an ECW I mean he he had tremendous matches that were over like crazy to the fans and even today with uh, Super Crazy and Yoshihiro Tajiri um they're not guys that Paul can headline a pay per view with. But they're guys when they're on the pay-per-view that that pull their weight and then some. Um, you know, probably more than the vast, vast majority of wrestlers in both WWF and WCW. So I think there's an effective use for them. Um, you have to give them personality. Um, but I, I I just think that like even even the ones who can't speak English, there's I think there's ways around it. Um, but the announcers have to do a hell of a job selling them, and that's the one thing that I think the WCW announcers, by and large, have been very weak at when they're out there. Uh, like the Mexicans or something, out there having a good match. The announcers are out there joking about the match, and then it, it basically makes the audience think, well, these guys are unimportant guys bouncing around the ring rather than these guys are, are um, having a great match and, and they're top talent. Right, and, and, you know, they, and I agree with that, Dave, and they can have great matches they do it's just you know the way i write television a a anyway I, I i i just don't like to really put cold matches out in the ring because these two guys are going to have a hell of a match i like more the combination of these two guys are going to have a hell of a match but they also have a story you know they also have a story to tell and again that, that's with me just getting to know them personally better and i i think we'll see more of that in the future there's one thing that I want to ask. What, what what's the deal with what happened with uh with Liger on Monday? Because that just seemed really weird. The whole the whole Liger Juventud Guerrera match and and no belt and um you know what 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 was the deal with Liger coming and and you know was was it was it his decision to come and was he supposed to drop the title? I mean was it you know how did that all go down? Well yeah, quite frankly, the, the commitment was made for him to come uh, before I came here, which that's cool. I have no problem with. Um, but again, I was told, well, he's coming on these dates. Uh, we're going to have him for two nitros, and in the, in those two nitros, we'd like to have him lose the belt and win it back. So, you know, basically, I, I was given these instructions because, as I said, it was a prior commitment, and uh, you know, so we were, you know, tr just tried to again tell a story in two weeks. As far as the belt is concerned, I, to this day, I don't know where the belt was. So, uh, you know, that's a good question that I'm going to have to find out myself on Monday. Now, what's the deal now? I mean, if if, uh, if, the, if the thing was for him to come in, you know, and, and drop it and then come, and then bring it back, um, then the guy he lost to has a broken arm. Or, well, what, do you know what exactly the injuries are that, that Hooventude has? Yeah, he broke his arm. Yeah, so the guy's got a broken arm. Then do you know how they're going to handle it? Or do you, do you yeah, know? Yeah, no, he's going to, you know, again, story-wise, you know, we'll, on, on Nitro, the story will make sense. And actually, you know, psychosis will wind up will wind up uh, uh, defending the belt for Hoovy against um, Liger. Okay, okay. Um, now, are you bringing the uh, the Varsity Club back? Uh, there's been a lot of talk about that, and uh, it looks like we probably are. Okay, okay. Um, let's get. But again, it's not going to be the same. You know, let me put it to you this way: the faces will be the same. But um, obviously, over the years, the Varsity Club would have had to change a little bit to keep up with the times. Okay. So it will be the Varsity Club that we knew, uh, but it will be a 2000 version. Okay. Um, 
uh, let's see now. Um, let's go to Rob in Florida. Doing. Rob. Hey, how you doing? Oh, doing pretty Doing really good. What's going on? Okay, here it is. Uh, uh, Vince, good job on the show. I, can, I mean, obviously, the, the improvement was just noticeable right from the get-go. I've noticed already the WWS repeating themselves quite a bit. It's getting a little bit stale, you know? But uh, that's just going to... They just lost quite a, a few people, at least uh, in the key positions, I believe. Um, I want to get right to the, the thing that's kind of like on, kind of on my mind here. You see, Flair, Ric Flair is like... Well, he's Ric Flair. And I'm reading that you're going to, at least the direction he's going to go, he's going to be a commissioner, which he's not happy about. He's not on TV whatsoever. I don't know, you were saying how you thought a lot of the guys would go for your style. I don't know if he didn't, and maybe there's some resistance thing there. But I would have to, I, in fact, I know Ric Flair would be much, I mean, God, you'd have to think he'd have to be much better as a wrestler, cutting promos. I mean, for, when WCW was at its worst, he was the only thing that had a ratings jump when he was on the, the cutting promos. I mean, he's one of the best in the business even right now. I mean, uh, I mean, do you do you believe that Ric Flair still has use for the company and as a wrestler, is or or not? Yeah, there, there's no question about it. As a matter of fact, one of, one of the reasons Ric Flair is on is on hiatus, and one of the reasons why we told the story we did was because you know Ric Flair was in the middle of everything just like every other other wrestler mm -hmm. and I mean and he really had nothing going on yeah I feel the same way about Ric Flair that you do that there's no I wouldn't be talking to you right now if it wasn't a Ric Flair about for Ric Flair so yeah. you know what we did was you know again and and it, it's a thing that we realized was going to hurt us in the ratings mm -hmm. but what we had to do was we had a shelf uh, you know Rick for a while so we could tell, you know, the story that we want to tell and bring Rick back in a spot where he is going to be in the spotlight and he is going to be in a role that is going to mean something other than just put him out there to wrestle a match every Monday night. So, you know, everything was done. And like I said, we even hurt the company and, you know, Quite frankly, my salary, because I get paid based on ratings, mm -hmm. by not having Flair on TV. But, you know, R Ric Flair is worth something more than to just make him wrestle every week to draw a rating. We just wanted to put the spotlight on him, and, you know, y you'll be seeing Flair back in the next couple of weeks. Awesome. Uh, now, I was curious about another thing, too. Since, uh, a lot of, I don't know if it was Bill Bush or, that was the one that was instrumental in really getting you over, but Terry Terrell also. I, there's two people that I think that are totally gone unnoticed by WCW that they should really try and bring in, and that's whoever directs the show, The Raw is War, because the, the show is just very well directed. And uh, the guy that does the music for the WWF, too. Well, you know, the thing is, l let me just stop you right there, because with the... I agree with you. There's no question about that. I, I, I You know... <laughs> WWF's production is 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 far and beyond the best. There are guys there that have been there for years and and they do tremendous jobs. I would give anything to have them here. But the reality of the situation is once everybody signed non-compete clauses, well that was really the end of anybody else coming over because the last thing WCW wants to do is be tied up in court with lawsuits. Mm -hmm. So whereas I would love to see that happen myself, unfortunately it's it's not going to. Okay. Um, I don't know how much more time Dave's going to let me have here. <laughs> but, just just uh, go make, make one real quick question, okay? Okay, I'm Love? sorry. Uh, yeah, basically, I was also too. The Oklahoma skit that was brought in, funny, but eh, you know, you know, taste is, you know, of course, taste and wrestling don't really go together anyway. But it really, I think, showed me more than anything else just how stale. And I'm not trying to get anybody fired or anything, but I'm just saying that just how boring Tony and Bobby are compared to Jim and Jerry. And I was thinking, I was wondering if you ever thought about Joey Styles. Wes Thatcher, he's he's got a great voice in uh, in Ohio, or even Scott Hudson from Thunder. I mean, it really would uh, make a big difference, I think, in the energy level of the show. Well, I, you know, I I, 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 I think uh, I think that Joey Styles is excellent. I was always a fan of his, and I think Scott Hudson is good as well. You know, is good as well. But again, you know, the way I look at it is, we came in with a completely new system. Yeah. Uh, 
He basically changed the business around, the way they were doing business at WCW. So now Bobby and Tony are being put out there on a weekly basis, and they have a product in front of them that is brand new to them. So I much rather work with them, uh, you know, bring them along. And, again, it, it takes time for them to get used to the system. But um, – I think Tony and, and Bobby can, and I mean, I, I believe they will. And again, it's just a matter of them getting used to me and me getting used to them. Uh, let's go to Western Virginia first. Wes, what's hey happening? Hey guys, how's it going? It's going really good. Uh, Vince, I wanted to ask you about the time change with WCW Nitro going from 8 to 10. Uh, seems like the biggest pro was that you need an unopposed hour to go against Raw, but with Thunder moving to Wednesdays and going from 9 to 11, you can do some more risque angles and also have two unopposed hours, but I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, first of all, uh, keep in mind, and, and this actually happened uh, before uh, the controversy surrounding the WWF. On Wednesday nights when we go to Thunder from 9 to 11, um, the rating is going to be TV PG because of our West Coast feed. It's on earlier. So just it's going to be TVPG. So as far as risque goes, it'll probably be more to toned down than Nitro. Um, as far as eight to ten, um, I I, I got to be honest with you, I hate that. Um, I hate the thought of yeah, it's great that we're unopposed from eight to nine, but then from ten to eleven, you are turning over the entire audience to Raw, and uh, they're going to get know, seven ratings in that se in that second hour every week. Uh, it, 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 I, if they don't do an eight, I think something will be wrong. And, I mean, the thought of that just kind of gives me a knot in my stomach. But, again, that's a programming decision. That That's a Brad Siegel, TNT programming decision. You know, everybody at WCW has told them that we want to go 9 to 11. We want to go head to head. Um, but the problem is they don't have a program to put on from 8 to 9. They, they think they'd be more successful putting on a certain program from 10 to 11. It's not a closed uh, door yet at this point because, like I said, everybody at WCW wants 9 to 11, and we're still fighting for that. Now, when does that start as far as the two-hour Nitro? Um, that, that, from what I'm told, that's supposed to start the first week in January. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, go, go ahead, Wes. Okay, okay, sorry. We're going to go to Carlos. Carlos in New York, you're up next. Hey, Vince, it's Carlos from New York. Hey, Carlos, how you doing? I'm back, back from the Reggie days. Yeah, how you I doing? I just call you off and just give you all my opinions of uh, Titan Sports. Um, basically, I'm just calling to congratulate you and uh, good luck with uh, WCW. You've been doing very well. Um, my only problem is the Mexicans. I feel like you can utilize them better, but other than that, They've been doing well. Congratulations. Uh, thanks a lot, man. I really, I really appreciate that. And, you know, again, as I said, um, who, whoever is on the WCW roster is going to be utilized. Right. All right, bro. That's the basic reason I haven't spoken to you in a while. I just wanted to congratulate you. Yeah, I'm glad you called. Thanks a lot. All right, man. Be careful. Bye-bye. Okay. I, I don't know exactly if you would want to, like, uh, go into detail on this question, but one thing um, that I really have not liked about the show and that is um, a lot of the segments have involved people that I think are, you know, they come off very, very amateurish. And, and in particular, I would say the stuff Monday, as far as um, the Nitro Girl segments on Monday, and and even like when the, when, uh, the guy in the Misfits was in the ring. I mean, it, you're just watching this and you're just going like, oh, my God. I mean, this is just like, this is worse than like the worst independent, you know, stuff and worse than, you know, public access television. I mean, part there's... Parts of the show um, that, that are well scripted, and, and some of the guys have adapted to the acting very well. You know, I think the Duggan stuff is, is very funny. I kind of question where it goes, but that's something else, that's something different. But I think it's funny. Um, but I think the Nitro Girl stuff is just it's just so bad to me. Well, you know, see again, Dave, and I'm I'm not going to argue. You know, the point of some stuff is good and some stuff isn't as, as good as it can be. But, you know, again, you, you've got to understand, you, you're faced with a position where you're coming into a company and it's like, okay, you know, here's your roster, these are the people under contract, these are the people that we're paying. So you have to literally take everybody, you know, I, I, I'm not talking about everybody, I'm talking about the people that are being paid and, you know, not really characters haven't really been defined. You have to take these people and you have to give them a role and give them the opportunity to justify what you're paying with them. And, you know, I mean, I really believe in giving everybody the opportunity and giving them the ball and putting them out there and, and see what happens. 
And, you know, the reality of the situation is some people are going to make it and some people aren't. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, just taking over, that's a process right now that, you know, we're starting to see, well, what's going to work and what's not going to work. Yeah. I mean, I just think that the, that the Nitro girls, particularly when they're actually in the ring, it's just like, you know, I know that some of the, the segments in WWF with, with Sable especially did, did incredible numbers. Um, but I think that part of the lure of that was the costuming and, you know, the way that, that, that what they were doing was very simple, but they did it. Whereas uh, when I've seen the Nitro girls out there, and I, I don't know if this is standards and practices, um, but the costuming is such that the people aren't really seeing it as TNA. They're just seeing it as, as um, you know, really bad stuff. I mean, I mean, I've heard the people boo a lot of those segments. Yeah, and, and again, I, I, um, there's no argument on this point, on this part. But again, I'm, I'm just for giving the people the opportunity and giving them the chance to make something. And it's, it's going to work for some people, and for others, it isn't. And you know, for for those that don't, then we'll move on to something else. And for those that do, we'll just build on it. Okay, let's go to David in New York. David, what's happening? Hey, well, I guess the question that I really want to ask uh, Vince is, how can he say that a uh, Mexican or Japanese wrestler will never get over in the U.S. if right now in ECW that super crazy Yoshihiro Tajiri and Masato Tanaka are just as over as anyone else yeah, in but ECW? Yeah, you're, you're, you're talking about being over in a company that's very small. I'm talking about being over on a on a national scale. But I was going to add to that, that, and then just I guess it was about two years ago in WCW that Ultimo Dragon was just about as over as anyone else in the company. Well, I I, 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 I don't know I don't know about that, but I do think that there was a period where Rey Mysterio Jr. when he first came in in the first six months, I noticed that he meant you know he was one of the biggest ratings draws in the company when he first came in. But I, I don't know. Because Dr Dragon never was good with ratings. I mean, I have to say that, and Ultimo Dragon is one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. But he time. did get big pops. I mean, he was a super worker in the ring, and no one will deny that. But, but um, don't you think but, the crowd reacted to him, I mean, better than... I think, they, I think they reacted to him as well as he was positioned, and probably better than he... I would even say better than he was positioned, because yeah, he never really thing. was positioned that strongly. I mean, Juventud Guerrero was the one guy that I thought that, that the, the guys in WCW, this is like a year ago, that the crowd reacted to much bigger than they were ever given the push was Chris Benoit and Juventud Guerrera. Those, those, you know, you know what I'm saying? Right. Okay, go ahead. Anyway. And also, um, but I was wondering if you ever think that you come across as racist in your promos, like by saying that Jushin Liger is only good at washing a car, or by booking Juventud to use a bottle of tequila or the pinata match, or you get where I'm going with this? I mean. Don't you think you come across like a racist? Well, not necessarily because I'm just playing the role of a character, and I'm, I'm playing the role of a character that, you know, literally, you know, as you can tell by the voice, is off of the streets of New York. Yeah, but you still booked moving to Carrera to use a bottle of tequila. Okay, and? My point, don't you think that's stereotypical? No, not at all. Why is that well, stereotypical? Yeah, right, we'll go ahead, go ahead. You don't think it's stereotypical for a Mexican wrestler to use a bottle of tequila as a weapon? No, because the the reason why he used the bottle of tequila, if you watched the show a few weeks ago, was because he gave me a bottle of tequila as a gift. Yeah, but why would so he still I have a bottle of tequila in his jacket? Thing, what, what was that? Why would he still have a bottle of tequila with him? Well, but that's what gave me the idea of how he could beat Liger because a week earlier he had given me a bottle of tequila. See, it's a story, and it goes from one week to the next. We didn't just pull a bottle of tequila. You know, okay, he's a Mexican, so he's going to hit him with a bottle of tequila. The bottle of tequila came into play because a week earlier he had given me a bottle of tequila as a gift. Okay, then what about the pinata match? What about the pinata match? It was just it, it was a way to do a gimmick match that made sense. But you booked Mexican wrestlers to use in a pinata match. Don't. Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, as far as it's racism, offensive. what? It's offensive. It's offensive to who? To a lot of people. Well, I, I I apologize if you think it's offensive. I don't think it's offensive because first of all, it's a story and it's make believe, and you have a guy 
booking a company from New York City, and yes, does he view people in certain ways? Of course he does, because it's where he was raised and it's what he knows. It's a story. It's make-believe. If but Vince still Russo booking was it. racist, then there would be no Mexican wrestlers and no Japanese wrestlers on television. We wouldn't be trying to develop roles for these people. It's a story that we're telling. Okay. Um, let's head. Let's. Uh, do we have any callers on the lo- on the bank right now? Okay. Let's go to the next one. Brent in C- Let's go to Brent in Seattle. Yes. Uh, hi, Vince. Hi. Um, back when uh, Ted Turner first started the Superstation, uh, he decided that he would do counter programming. And so, if they had the news on on the uh, you know on the local affiliates for ABC, NBC, and CBS, he would have on Andy Griffith during the Super Bowl. He still has Andy Griffith all day. That that's that was that's his philosophy. Uh, and so, the the uh, WCW, regardless of what a good job you're doing and whether you, your program is superior to the WWF or not, is not getting as good of ratings. You're not even close. And so with the WWF doesn't have anyone that has a very good work rate, really, or at least they don't use them. Work rate is not important to Vince McMahon. Why doesn't WCW consider having long matches and emphasizing a good work rate? Because they have the workers like that. Because, uh, unfortunately, and again, I've been looking at the ratings for the last six years now because that's been my job. And, unfortunately, if you want to bring in a mass audience, and draw a huge rating that it, it, it's not just the wrestling match that's not what they want and that's why you know the, the the ratings history over the years that's why you've seen it go from back and forth and back and forth the, the WWF when I started there the rating was at a 1.7 and the reason the rating was at a 1.7 is because it was 1996 and they were booking the show. It, you, you had Pr- Pritchard and Patterson still in there booking the show, and they were booking the show like it was 1980. Nobody cared anymore, and they were losing. They, 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 you know, Vince was close to bankruptcy. Um, you know, when 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 he brought me in and I started writing television with him, and you know, the fans obviously, you know, they grew up and they evolved. But the product hadn't. And I think, and, and, and that's what happened when I was over at the WWF. It wasn't about, you know, it wasn't just about wrestling. It was the storylines and the controversy and the cutting edge. And I mean, you, you, you saw the ratings, you know, go through the roof while the ratings at WCW that had two and three segment wrestling matches. They were going down the toilet. And again, it, it, it's not about what Vince Russo wants. It's about what the people want. And obviously, again, if you want to capture the masses, um, you know, the casual fan, you have to go beyond the wrestling ring to do that. Okay. Well, um, there's an old saying that you can't make chicken salad out of chicken. Well, anyway, I can't say that on That's the air. That's not true. But, but, actually, 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 you can say anything you want on this show. Many weeks. Go, we're, we're, we're Patterson and, and, and uh, Pritchard were booking that stuff, and they were drawing a 1.7. They didn't have anything to work with. Vince McMahon didn't have any good workers for them. And so no matter whether they, whether they used them for that or When I started writing television for the WWF, Stone Cold Steve Austin was the ringmaster, and, Rock, and The Rock was Rocky Maivia. They were there. They were on the roster. They didn't know what to do with them. So he did have the talent, but he had, you know, T.L. Hopper and the goon and, and who, and, you know, they were this. doing wow. 80s characters in a, in a 1996 world. The talent was on the roster. They just weren't tapping it at the time. I suppose I'm thinking further, further back then. But, yeah, I, I see the point. They, they did have some talent, but they didn't have nearly as much as, as WCW does now. Dave, you'll have to back me up on this, but, but is, wasn't WCW or NWA's heyday back when they had Flair and Funk and Flair and, and Steamboat? You're talking uh, 1989 period now? Uh, yes. Okay, 1989. Yeah. What, what about it? Uh, oh, oh, you mean like as a period that, that, that had good pay-per-view buy rates that, that, or that had good uh, house show attendance because that was most important back then? 
Okay, um, in 89, the house show attendance was, you got to remember that, that was a company that, that didn't really know what it was doing, and it was coming off of a period where they had really self-destructed in 87 and 88, and um, their house show attendance was pretty much struggling. Uh, as I recall, by early 90, they were getting some real good TV ratings. 89 were okay to good, but TV ratings weren't as important, and the buy rates were... They were they were so so. I mean, um, you know, it, you can't compare eighty nine buy rates with ninety nine buy rates because all of the buy rates in eighty nine were way bigger than ninety nine just because pay per view was something new. It's a different era. But I mean, like you know, if you're gonna look at like you know, Ric Flair and Terry Funk did a one point five buy rate in nineteen eighty nine. That looks like it's you know, you know, I mean, that would be like uh, you know, except for WrestleMania, you know, nothing's gonna do that this year, right? So um, you know, it looks good today, but it, it, it's different. It's different, but it did, you know, those those wrestling matches in those eras, they did good TV ratings. And by early 90, WCW was doing some really good TV ratings, and then they self-destructed in 90 again, as they had done you, you know, David, so many David, times over the last decade. You know, it's interesting, too, for that last caller. And, I mean, I, I think this is really it in black and white. Um, the week before this past Monday, we we had really cut the gap to the closest it's been in a long time. I mean, I think the rating was they did a 5-5, five, five, we did a 3-3. Three, three. So it was down to 2.2, which at, you know, at one point it was averaging out over 4. This past Monday, okay, where we... Uh, I mean, we had Nash and Goldberg, uh, you know, uh, up and down. I mean, uh, we, we had a pay-per-view card, okay? It was up against a wedding. The whole show on Raw was based around a wedding. They went from a 5-5 five five to a 6-5. The whole show was based on a wedding. So, I mean, that is telling you right there what the people want. And a lot of times, you know, people get hot at me, the, the, the wrestling purists that, you know, want a good match and want long wrestling matches. But, again, it, it's not me. I'm getting paid based on a rating, and it is my job to do a rating. So, therefore, I have to try to give everybody what they want. Okay, let's go to John in Atlanta first. Hey, John, guys. what's going on? Not much. Uh, you're right on the. I'm a 20 year fan, Vince, and uh, you're right on the storyline. So you're not alone out there. Not all our 20 year fans out here think it's just wrestling and nothing about story. Um, I wanted to urge you. It's to, it's both. It's, it it's is. both. It is. Yeah, it, it is. But, Dave, you know, I, I, I got to agree. I mean, I have to tell you that there's no doubt in my mind that it's both because one thing that I've seen and I, and I just want to add this is, you know. We're, in my opinion, I mean, I'm writing the best storylines I can. You know, you know, the fans might not think they're the best storylines, and I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I'm writing the best stories that I think I can. But, you know, when you put that story out in the ring, the guys need to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a difference between the, you know, between the WWF when I was there and the WCW, and I think at the WCW, there was a while there where guys were getting paid big contracts, big money, and going through the motions. Um, and, you know, right now, you know, we are working very, very hard of, of changing that at WCW and lighting a fire under these guys because, again, you're right, it is both because you need to write the story, but when they get in the ring, they need to go or else nothing's going to work. Yep, yep. I wish to urge you, uh, I don't know if you're obviously not the only decision maker there, but to urge you to do the disclaimers on the wrestling, don't try this at home. More than just WWF doing it, because I read in the newsletter that you know another kid died by some wrestling moves. It's just needless. So I'd urge that WCW also do that, especially since their wrestling displays a more risky style. No, that, that, that's a that's a real good idea, and I will bring that up if it hasn't been brought up already. The uh, now there's two things I wanted to get your uh, input on. Uh, one, I was hoping you were thinking about using Ron Anderson to manage or be a mouthpiece for Chris Benoit, because he's he's great talker Arn Anderson is and two if Shawn Michaels was available would you go for him well we 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 are going to use Arn Anderson I think you've seen a couple the last couple of weeks there is uh you know he's definitely being worked in um I don't think we're going to tie him up with Chris Benoit but he will have a a, a uh an important and big role uh -huh. and a lot of that will will be talking because unfortunately uh, Arn can't do too much physically anymore. Um, if Shawn Michaels were available, I'd pick him up in a heartbeat. Yeah, yeah, okay. 
and uh, keep up the good work. And I'm just, I know that it's going to even get better as the guys get used to reading such long scripts and such like that, too. I could, you know, it's just time will, you know, it'll, the tide will turn, I believe. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Um, Vince, you know, one of the things that I've, I'm always interested in and everyone is what type of, um, um, how much contact are you having right now as far as with WWF talent? And is there interest in guys when their contract is up to come over? And, and are there a lot of guys you're interested in, or are you pretty much interested in just making the most of this roster? And oh, well, no, you know, I, I'm interested in making the most of this roster. I mean, there's no question about that, but I, I'd be lying to you if I told you I wasn't interested in, in some of the guys at the WWF. And, I mean, and on a weekly basis, I still talk to a lot of the guys at the WWF. Um, I mean, a lot of them were friends. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, when I le and this is how this business is, you know, when I left the WWF, you know, when it came to office, I mean, I, I became the Antichrist. Um, but as far as talent, you know, they're a little bit more human about it. So uh, I've been able to really maintain those contacts because, you know, a lot of those guys are my friends. Now, do you think it's conceivable that over the course of, say, the year 2000, that, that you're going to be able to lure several guys over if their contracts are up? Or I, I think there's no question about that because I have to tell you something. And, again, you know, Dave, I want you and everybody to understand I'm not, I'm not by any means taking shots at WWF. I just worked at that system for so long that, you know, I know how it is, and I knew what was going to happen when I left. And, you know, basically working under Vince and, you know, when we worked together, you know, Vince's focus was always on the top guys. I mean, the top five guys. Vince, Vince's first question every week was, what's Austin doing? I mean, he always used to focus on those top five guys. And, you know, when I left, um, you know, it hurt me because, you know, our focus, of course, was on the top guys because that's where your money is. But the underneath guys, that's where your future is. And, you know, Ed Ferraro and myself, I mean, you know, we put a lot of time into, you know, the Bob Hollies and the D'Lo Browns and the, uh, you know, the Edges and the Christians and the Hardys. And, you know, that's the, the, the talent that we really tried to develop because we knew that that was the future. And, uh, you know, I knew that when I left the WWF, the focus on that middle-of-the-road talent was not going to be there anymore because, you know, as I said, it, it wasn't Vince's priority. So I think when contracts are up, you know, those guys in the middle with all the talent in the world that knew how closely Ed and myself worked with them, yeah, I think there's going to be some interest of bringing some of those guys over to WCW. Are there guys in W? Let's, let's, let's go like a year from today. Who uh, in WCW do you think are going to be elevated to the, the top tier level? Well, I think right now you're in the process of, uh, of Chris Benoit and Jeff Jarrett getting there real quick. And, uh, you know, that, that's what we've been doing. And, again, Dave, a lot of your callers, and I know you as well, you talk about workers. I agree with you, and as I said, that there's still a lot of people in WCW that are making a lot of money. We're not doing anything work-wise for a long time. So the idea is to get Jarrett, get Benoit in that upper level, let them work with these guys, let them light fires under these guys, because if these guys now don't come up to their level, well, then they're going to make that talent look bad. So, you know, that's why those two guys were chosen to really bring up quickly based on the work rate. Um, but there's a lot of guys. I mean, um, you know, Billy Kidman, you know, I think he's, uh, you know, he's a great star. Again, I think he needs to really work on his mic skills and his personalities, but there's so much he can do. Um, when, when Rey Mysterio gets healthy again, I mean, he's another star, and I mean, Eddie Guerrero, too, he, he's having a lot of uh, physical problems, but, you know, he's another one. I see a guy that we really haven't done anything with, uh, you know, Lash LaRue, and when that guy talks, and even if he's cutting a 20, 30-second promo, I mean, just the flow and the personality and the, and the charisma is there. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of guys that I think are really going to rise to the top over the next year. Was, is anything, have you, are you able to do anything with Lenny Lane? Uh, I, I'm, I'm still working on that. As a matter of fact, we were, we were talking about Lenny and Lodi today. Um, because ever since I, I came on the job, I kind of inherited that problem. 
and you know basically the company here uh, w was taking a, a, a stand saying you know bluntly period we would never see Lenny and Lodi on TV again so me not even knowing them personally I was like well wait a minute you're gonna make two guys that do this for a living and that love this business and built their whole careers on the wrestling business they're not going to work again in this company because of an angle that they were put in. I mean, that that just didn't make any sense for me. So it's almost been like a you know a, a personal fight on my own for Lenny and Lodi because those guys deserve to have a role in this company. And I think before all is said and done, um, you know, hopefully by by the first of the year they will. Uh, what about Randy Savage? What kind of, I mean, are, is, is he going to be kept? Are the negotiations still going on, or is it just kind of, because he kind of is, I don't know, he did that one interview, and then we've, we haven't seen him since. Well, yeah, what happened was Randy did the one interview because Randy came in, and I got together with him at Halloween Havoc, and, you know, I knew Randy at the WWF, and, uh, you know, we talked about a, a story idea uh, that we were both really hot for, and he really liked it, and I thought it would work, and it was really special for Randy. Um, but then they got down to dollars and cents, and that's kind of where I bow out. I, I try not to get involved. And, uh, you know, the, the two parties were very far apart in, in money. And um, unfortunately, I don't think they're going to be able to get close together. So that's kind of where it is right now. Okay, let's go to Bob in California. Bob, you're up next. Uh, hey. Hey, how you doing? Uh, yeah, hope you got a great buzz on the phone today. Uh, yeah, Vince, um, what kind of pressure are you getting from standards and practices right now? Because uh, I'm asking this in relation to Vance, Vance Curl's match on the pay-per-view, where he was expected to go crazy and cut his head open from ear to ear, and all of a sudden it turned into the biggest cluster after you. you know. Well, I, uh, I'll be totally honest with you. that Right now, you know, there's a lot of pressure from standards and practices, and the reason there is, quite frankly, is because it's nothing we've done it's the sponsors pulling out of the WWF. And, of course, you know, the sponsors are right there threatening, well, WCW, if, if you come close to this, we're going to pull you too. Um, like I said, and, you know, whether people want to believe me or not, that's up to them. We don't need to do what we did at the WWF because we have the talent roster to tell entertaining stories. We don't need to do shock TV. But I think what's happening is that standards and practices right now, today, is really going too far the other way. And, you know, to me, that they're having problems with some things that, in my opinion, are just are totally ridiculous. And, I mean, things that I wouldn't even think twice about. But I, I think once the controversy with the WWF blows over, um, you know, I, I think we can get back to business as usual. Well, I was under the impression that when you signed, you thought you had a freer hand than you did. Well, I, like I said to you, I did have that free hand until the situation started with Coca-Cola and, and sponsors dropping the WWF. I think WCW and, you know, not even WCW, I think standards and practices – Right now, to be honest with you, I think they're in a panic mode. So everything we do, they are looking at through the micro microscope, and I can understand that. And, uh, you know, like I said, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's things that are not even controversial. They're more ridiculous. ridiculous. But, again, as this thing blows over, I think, you know, so will the issue with standards and practices. Well, then what happens? like... Okay. Is there like one, one thing like um, um, that that you could point to that it was just like over the edge as far as like you know you had something that you thought was like you probably didn't give a second thought to that they've nixed like lately? Oh, I, I can tell you numerous things. I mean, one of them being uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I believe it was this past Monday. Uh, Piper drives up to the building in a limo, okay, and these two, uh, well, especially one, uh, Rhonda Singh. An overweight woman gets out of a car next to him. Piper being Piper would have made a derogatory statement towards that woman. A, he wasn't in a good mood to begin with. We made him come to the building to referee. He didn't want to be there. He didn't want to referee. He sees this woman getting out of the car next to him. She shoots him a look. He would have made a derogatory comment her way. Well, Roddy couldn't make a derogatory comment to a heavy set woman because 
out there in the world, we might have offended a heavy set woman. Are you getting the same pressure now because of Ferrara's uh, impersonation of Rob? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And well, I mean, then how and long, again, well, let me ask it, you then, how long do you think you can put up with this? I mean, it's really oppressive because it's making the, the storylines read like third grade plays because you can't get any kind of an edge because Ted Turner has somehow, you know, reinvented morals. I mean, how, how far can you go before you got to go, this isn't going to work? Well, I mean, and again, if I get to that point, that's what I will say. Because, you know, I'm a person and, you know, people can say whatever they want about Vince Russo and, yeah, I came here for the money and this, that, and the other, everything else. Well, that, that has nothing to do with it. I mean, I, I am the type of person that I have a lot of pride and I need to put out there the best product that I can because, quite frankly, I want to win. That's the kind of person I am. I want to beat the WWF in the ratings. That's what they paid me for. But now they've got these handcuffs on you. Exactly, and that's why I'm saying if, if it ever got to the point that I was like, look, you know, you're not letting me do my job. I'm doing everything I can do. Um, if you don't help me, this is not going to work. Well, if it ever got to that point, then I would probably just say thank you very much and leave. Okay, well, then this, I just specifically, what happened in the pay-per-view match with Vampiro? What are you talking about now? Well, he was planning to go crazy. I mean, it was well known that, you know, he was he was going to do one of his classic bloodbath. Yeah, well, again, you know, that, that that really wasn't a standards and practice issue, to be honest with you. What had happened was the pay-per-view at Havoc, okay, the one before that. We had we had gone to Brad Siegel. We, we explained to him how important it was for Sid to get juice in that match. We were telling a story that was going to continue on for the next three months. Uh, Brad Siegel, you know, he understood that. He knew we weren't getting juice for the sake of getting juice. He knew we were telling a story, so he gave us the green light, and we did that. Unfortunately, the following match, which, which was Flair and Page, Flair went into business for himself. And, you know, you had blood on top of blood on top of blood. So, therefore, when we got to make... We really made the decision, look, because of, you know, because of Flair last month and because we really went over the top, it, it was probably a smart thing to stay away from that at the Mayhem pay-per-view. So we weren't told, uh, no juice, I mean, we weren't told that. We just figured that, you know, knowing what we're dealing with, it was probably in our best interest to stay away from it. Really quickly, I just want to give you uh, the results of the poll. Do you think last night's toning down of the language and sexual content on WF SmackDown made the show better or more entertaining, less entertaining, or no difference at all to you? More entertaining, 17%. Less entertaining, 15%. It made no difference, 68%. So um, I guess this basically, pretty overwhelmingly actually, says that uh, the toning down of SmackDown did not hurt the show. And I would agree with that. I thought that, um, that the show was an entertaining show. Um, and I thought that the fact that the women were wearing slightly more clothes and that there was a little bit less swearing, I, I didn't hurt my enjoyment of the show one bit. Uh, let's go to, uh, we'll go to uh, John in Maryland. John, what's going on? Hey, how you doing, guys? Um, I had a question for you, Vince. Um, the park is angle. Hello? Yeah, I'm listening. Um, yeah. Yeah, the park is angle where he, uh, where they had someone speaking for him. Whatever happened to that? We're still doing it. He just and hasn't spoken since. Is that? Is, and this is where is, where is this going to lead eventually? Is this going to is this going to happen for other workers that can't speak English? No, it's, no. It's, it, it was just something we did that was a little unique for um, for Kaz and, and Lapaka. No, it, it, it was just, we just kind of gave it to them. But that storyline will continue. As a matter of fact, on Nitro uh, this week, uh, you know, we kind of find a spot a, a spot for Lapaka. So, oh, really? you know, again, we're just trying to play everybody in. Right. And uh, what's your thoughts on D'Lo Brown? I, I um, love D. I, I would grab D'Lo in a heartbeat. And because uh, I did hear that there's some truth to that uh, rumor that's been going around everywhere. Yeah, um, you know, again, D'Lo was one of those guys, you know, in the middle um, that, that I think, you know, would, would you know, it, it is, is and will continue to suffer, you know, greatly with the departure of, you know, Ed Farrar and myself. Yeah, um, I think he's had that stigma ever since the unfortunate accident. Yeah, and, I think uh, so too. And you know, sometimes there comes a point 
where you know if you have a, a certain wrestler in a in a spot in the same company for so long, you, you, it gets to the point that it's very difficult to elevate. Um, that performer because they've been pigeonholed for so long and you know when you get to that point in your career I think it's important to then make a jump because now if you make a jump and you have a name and you start at a different level well now you can become somebody and Absolutely. I think you know that could be the case for D'Lo yeah I, I definitely see a, you know a lot of opportunity with some of the great workers for him to work with in, uh, in WCW yeah no I, I would jump all over that if he became a uh, Vince, you still there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Vince, I was gonna ask you: is is, uh, is do you know if he's available soon? Because we've heard like conflicting stories on that one. Uh, I've heard conflicting stories myself as well, and and I I really don't have the answer to that. I know he's got a contract, and I think there's some kind of an option in in January. I don't know if that's a two way option or a one way option. Um, so I I honestly don't know. Okay. Uh, let's let's head to some of these emails. We've got a, a huge stack here. Actually, the first guy's name is Mark Stack, and he he asks, "Don't you think catering your show to the smart marks is going to backfire since it leaves most of the audience who aren't smart marks in the dark?" I I really don't think we're catering to smart marks. I mean, I I, I really don't. I think the smart marks like to believe that. You know, there's a very small percentage of uh, of fans that really are smart to the business and understand it. I think I think the number is much greater than that, and I don't think we're doing anything on our show that an an, an average fan wouldn't understand. Really? Okay. Because uh, actually, two of my best friends who are what I would call like real casual fans, and they're actually pretty decent barometers in that when WCW took off, probably before the ratings even showed a switch. They were, uh, this is this, you know, going back a couple of years ago, they right. were just like, you know, WCW is getting really hot. And then, you know, in 97, when WWF was actually getting killed in the ratings, I just remember them going like, you know, WWF is really getting interesting now. Mm -hmm. And they don't read my newsletter, and we rarely actually talk wrestling because they know that, like, when I'm away from wrestling, I hate to talk it. Um, but, um, you know, I know that when we, we've talked about, they were over a couple weeks ago, and when we talked about some of the stuff, I, they don't really get a lot of the stuff that's going on in WCW, although... They seem to think it's more interesting than it's been, but when we started talking about different things, they just kind of didn't understand a lot of the inside stuff. Well, I, I, I got to be honest, I think the only inside stuff that we really did and we kind of got have been away from for, for the last month or so was really the, the buff angle. I mean, I, I think that was really the most inside that we've, we've gone. I mean, other than that, I, I really don't think that there's, there's anything on the show that people wouldn't understand is there some particular that you know actually that actually that was like a that was probably the prime example that, that right. um yeah, no, they, I, you know, I agree whole, with that i agree yeah. with that but again we we've, we've gotten away from that and i don't think you know we've really done anything in the past month that everybody wouldn't have got okay this is from gary godso who asks um can you shed any light on unfinished angles that were started before you left, such as who pu pushed Mankind off the ledge in the Boiler Room match with Triple H? Was that going to go anywhere, or was that just something to... Well, actually, it was Davey Boy. Oh, it was? It was supposed yeah. to be Davey Boy? <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and also, are you going to dump the TV title? He says, if, if so, great. I never understood it anyway, <laughs> you know. Yeah, we, we are. It's finished. Okay, because there are just too many titles, right. I think, mm -hmm. right? Um, and he also says, I think the Oklahoma bit's getting old and tired. It was funny the first time, sort of humorous the second time, but it's run its course. So anyway, that's... But see, and again, I, I appreciate that. But again, you know, Oklahoma wasn't just brought on to, you know, do a Jim Ross parody. This story goes someplace. I mean, so again, we just need time to tell stories, you know. Now, now one of the callers was talking, and you kind of mentioned that standards and practices had gotten down on that. What exactly, you know, was that about? Well, you know, what, what exactly that was about is, uh, you know, the way Turner runs here is, you know, we have, I don't know, what, two, two and a half million people watch the show every week. The Oklahoma segments have done well in the ratings. I mean, because, again, we get the breakdown. I get a minute by minute, so I see what the fans are watching and what they're not watching. That segment has done particularly well. Well, you know, standards and practices now, they get five letters. Uh, of people who have Bell's palsy or know somebody with Bell's palsy and are offended by this. Now, there's probably a good chance that three out of the five people are WWF Jim Ross fans, 
but regardless, if you know, if they get five letters out of two and a half million people, well, then you know, that's enough for them to kill an angle. So you know, that's that's what you're constantly dealing with, and whether people want to believe me or not, the fact is, when we were thinking of doing the Jim Ross parody, having been around Jim for so long and knowing him inside and out. The Bell's palsy never even entered our mind. That's not what it was about. The whole angle was about, you know, a guy in the wrestling business who, who takes himself more seriously than any individual I've ever met my entire life. And, you know, he's got a way of being very overdramatic in his calls of matches and whatnot. That's what the parody was. Um, you know, we didn't do a parody to say, well, let's make fun of Jim Ross because he's got Bell's palsy. We weren't even thinking of that because when you work with him for so long, you're so beyond that and so used to it that Jim Ross is just Jim Ross. And we were just trying to do a parody on the character. We were, we were not trying to offend people with Bell's palsy in any way. So now he, he, uh, Ed Ferraro, when he does the characterization, he, the, he, the Bell's palsy part of it, is he's not allowed to do it? Is that what the thing is? Or? Yes. Or, okay, okay, okay. Yes, yes. Um, okay, this is, uh, just about the great Muda never talked, and he was one of the most overheels in WCW at the time. Actually, that was 10 years ago. I, I, the, I mean, I, I, I have, uh, you know, two thoughts on that, and one is I think if it's done correctly, it can be done, but everyone has to also realize that, that, what worked in 1989 or 1979 or 1969 may work in 1999, but it's not necessarily the same thing. This business, to me, this business is completely different than it was even two years ago, let there, alone. You're, you're right. I mean, Dave, it changes every day, and that's what, you know, especially the smart marks. I, you know, so many times I, I hear the criticisms, and to me, it, it's evolution. I mean, it's evolution in baseball and football and hockey. There's evolution in life, and as this business changes, I mean, you know, we just need to go with the flow or else, you know, we're going to be out of business. And it's not a matter of, you know, well, Vince Russo doesn't want to see a 20-minute wrestling match. That's got nothing to do with it. It's you, you just have to put out there what the people are buying. Yeah, I, I do think also, though, that um, in, in the right situation, um, with the right characterizations, um, you know, someone like a great Muda today also would be able to get over. But it's like it had to be done differently, though. Right, um, exactly. I, yeah, this is... Uh, and and um, it's the same, you know, you talked about the Varsity Club before. The Varsity Club was over, and the Varsity Club, I, I enjoyed that tremendously. I, I was very entertained with that angle when, when they did it. And again, it's going to be interesting. Okay, let, let's bring them into 1999. Let's see what works. Let's see how, what we have to do differently. Let's see if these guys can get over. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons to do it. Okay, this is from Damon who says, uh, it's actually about longer matches and everything. His feeling is, is that you have outstanding workers and actors. You can book them to use their strengths. Uh, stupid short matches and long, boring angles are not necessarily better than mid-length matches that are supported by interesting and intelligent plots. You know, I, I think that if you, if you put two guys cold out there, and even if they're two good workers, uh, and we've seen it a million times with Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, and Dean Malenko, and they don't necessarily do good ratings, mm -hmm. but I think that if there's... A, if you have the right match at the right time, such as like when, when Bret Hart wrestled Benoit, and granted that didn't do a super rating, but at least the rating went up during, you know, the, during the entire match and it went 30 minutes. I think that as something different, um, and I don't think you could fill a show up with 30 minute matches, but once a month with the right storyline and obviously you would need the right guys. Um, I think you could do a 20 minute match on TV, maybe even a 30 minute match once a year. Well, I, I, I disagree with you, but I'm also willing to try that to see what happens. And like, you know, you're right, but you know, there are very few guys and and very few combinations where you're going to get that. But again, I'm I'm not I'm open to trying that. What's that? What is that? Oh, anyway, uh, this is from Chris Hodgson who wants to know if uh, you can talk about if WCW has any plans to do uh, expand their TV or pay per view in the United Kingdom. Uh, that that I'm, I'm really not sure about. Again, I, I've just been concentrating so much on television and, you know, the pay-per-view that I haven't even gone there yet. Okay, this is about, uh, this is basically about stuff that we have already covered here. What, uh, what do you think of Steve Regal? Well, again, I think Steve Regal is a great worker. Uh, but
but quite frankly, I think Stephen Regal is very boring. And if 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 he could come up to speed um, and, and and just change his style a little bit, um, I think he he has something to offer. But I, I think again, Regal is a guy that needs to adapt a little bit. Mm hmm. Um. This is uh. What's your personal feelings on Shawn Michaels? Hello? Yeah, do you hear that? It was there and then it's gone like a match game or something. Yeah, yeah. I just got it. Okay, what was the last question? Oh, oh what's your per this is from Kevin. He got, wants to know, what's your personal feelings on Shawn Michaels? Well, I always had a love-hate relationship with Shawn because I was always stuck in the, in the middle of the love-hate relationship with Vince and Shawn. So I took a lot of Vince's heat when it came to Shawn because I, I got to tell you something. I was around for Vince McMahon for a very long time. And Shawn Michaels intimidated Vince McMahon more than any other talent ever, period. Really? And that's a fact. So a lot of times when, you know, Vince didn't want to deal with Shawn, well, you know, he went to the go-to guy, and that was me. So I took a lot of heat, you know, Vince's heat. When Shawn had a beef uh, with Vince, I was right there in the middle of it, and I was the messenger a lot. And a lot of time I took heat and let Shawn yell and scream at me for stuff that wasn't my fault because I was taking the heat for Vince. But the reality of it is love, love him or hate him, and he is difficult to work with. Um, he's probably one of the three best in this business all around at what we do. And that's why, you know, the love, the hate, the good times, and the bad guys would be worth it to have him in WCW. In uh, with WWF um, about to lose uh, Mankind and perhaps Austin as full-time performers, if you were around... Uh, who would you elevate to like, uh, are there any people who you would try to bring up to like that to, to go up in the sphere with The Rock and maybe Hunter and some of the other top guys? Well, yeah, I think, you know, God, I think you have a lot of guys. I think you have, you know, Val and, and, and Test and, and, and Edge. And I think they have had some opportunities to elevate those guys. And I don't think they've taken the opportunity, and of course, Jericho. I don't think they've taken those opportunities. And, you know, I also feel that if they don't take those opportunities soon, I really think that they're going to hurt themselves because they need to elevate those guys. Okay. Vince, I want to thank you so much for doing this show. And um, we are out of time, and we've got a million more questions here. And hopefully we can – it would be great if we could arrange it sometime in the future. And um, good luck because everyone wants to see WCW. I think everyone wants a competitive wrestling war because it's the best thing for everyone. Right. And I agree with that. And whenever you want me on, Dave, I'll be happy to do it.